Hair Baby. Hey guys, today we're going to be playing Fall Streak. Peering down from the sky above, a golden eye strains to remain open as sleep tugs at its eyelids. A solitary house lies draped in its fading warmth, nestled in the land like an egg waiting to hatch. At its side stands a weathered old tree. The swing that hangs from it rests in utter stillness, lacking any wind to stir it. Within the house silence settles softly around the figure of a sleeping young girl, like the downy feathers of a newborn chick. Her eyes flicker and shift as she begins to awaken. The first breath of awakening escapes my lips as the world fades into view like after a dream. A ceiling, different from the one that belonged to my bedroom, could be seen, dappled in golden light. I see, upon falling asleep, I had returned to this place. A timeless realm that existed somewhere between the waking world and the world of dreams. A place where one never went hungry and the sun never moved from its spot in the sky. Once again, I was back at that place. Hmm. <laughs> Though time wasn't an issue in the golden dream, sitting around became unbearable rather quickly. Let's go outside. The vivid golden light of an eternal sunset fills my vision as I exit the house. With no particular destination in mind, I start moving my legs towards the horizon. Eventually, the house behind me shrinks to but a tiny dot in the distance. But even then, green grass is the only thing that stretches out before me. I had done this many times already, so I knew. The golden dream was a wrapping world. No matter what direction you went, if you continued in a straight line, you always ended up back at the house. Isolated and closed off, it wasn't wrong to think of the golden dream as a prison. But if so, the waking world of Socatrine was just as much of a prison. Mm, it's going to be a hassle to walk a full loop back around to the house. Ah, you're here. A presence had appeared at my side during my aimless wandering. Though calling it a presence was a bit of a stretch seeing as how I couldn't see, hear, or touch it. How then did I know it was there? Well, let's just say there's a lot of things that don't make sense in this place. Good evening, Tubby. <laughs> That's an awkward name. Tubby, a childish name I had given the immaterial being a long time ago upon noticing it for the first time. Since Tubby didn't exactly have much to work with in terms of characteristics, I had never been able to come up with a better name. Oh well, you like the name Tubby, don't you? Though Tubby appeared at my side during my stays in the Golden Dream every now and then, it was hard to say it offered much in the form of company. Though there are things I can only do when you're around. Lowering myself to the grass, I start to visualize a bicycle in my head. I try conceptualizing every aspect of the bike that I can, from its metal frame to its air-filled tires. I even go the extra mile and imagine a cute little bell perched on the handlebars. Concentrating deeply, I shut my eyes. With a slow inhale, I bring my contemplation on the image to a peak. <sighs> Upon opening my eyes, I find the very bicycle I envisioned standing before me, as if it had been there all along. Wow, it came out pretty nice. Let's give it a go. I try mounting the bike. But the poor contraption immediately falls apart under my weight, sending me plummeting to the ground with a heroic faceplant. Ugh, ow. I don't know why, but whenever Tubby is with me, tinkering around with the fabric of this world becomes possible. There are limits to what I can do, though. Anything I try to instantiate possesses complete fidelity to my vision, so complications arise if I don't truly understand what I'm trying to conceive. Though I understood the general theory behind how a bike worked, when you get down to the nitty gritties, it's a complex machine that requires many parts to work together in harmony to perform its function. Oh well, not planning on being a bicycle mechanic when I grow up anyways. 
Heartened, I detach the bell from the broken down bike and give it a ring as I resume my journey on foot. But it only creates a dull and pitiful sound like clapping wood before crumbling to dust in my hand. Well, looks like we can cross building bells off of our list of ambitious dreams as well. Upon returning to the house, I stop and ponder the motionless swing under the tree. Several hours had probably already passed, not that it really mattered. Before I knew it, the tree was creaking and groaning overhead like a grandpa cajoled into giving a kid a piggyback ride. As I sway through the air, my thoughts stray onto a peculiar avenue. I wonder if God has woes. The nature and veracity of such an existence aside, it was the implication of being all-knowing that interested me. Omniscience, in a way, it could be said I possessed a certain degree of it when it came to the golden dream. There is nothing that ever happens here without my knowledge, after all, because nothing changes in this place unless I dictate or define so. I wonder if it's the same. I wonder if, from God's perspective, the universe doesn't change unless they dictate or define so. If so, I can't think of omniscience as anything more than a curse. If my time in the Golden Dream has taught me anything, it's that experiencing new events beyond your control is an irreplaceable treasure. There is beauty in having things happen even when you do not will them to. But looking forward to a hopeful tomorrow full of seemingly endless possibilities is a privilege of the transient and unknowing. For an omniscient being, nothing is random, nothing is unexpected, and nothing is unknown. Tomorrow would only hold the promise of predetermined eternality. It would be like being trapped in the golden dream forever. Just imagining it feels suffocating. Huh. Anyways, your turn, Tubby. Bringing the swing to a halt, I take a seat on the grass and cover my ears. Darkness fills my vision as I shut the everlasting sunset from my eyes. If there was one thing that kept my mind from breaking in this golden purgatory, it was that I had Tubby by my side. Even though Tubby never acts on its own without my input or prompting, the fact that his presence allows me to believe in a will other than my own is my lifeline. When I let go of my ears and open my eyes, I briefly hear the sound of creaking. Looking back, I catch sight of the swing gliding through the air. Ow! I flop gracelessly onto my back as the swing crashes into my forehead. You're such a bully, Tubby. Though everything had transpired according to my design, putting the blame on Tubby instilled much needed color to the bleak reality. It'd be nice if we could play together. Playing on the swing wasn't as fun when there was no one to push you. I always end up finding myself here, don't I? My cradle and my cage. The Celestial Library. That was the name I had given the sprawling room painted over with stars. Space was distorted in several rooms in the Golden Dream, but it was only here that it felt like the heavens itself were spreading out before you. What should I read today? Books that couldn't be found in the waking world and books that spoke of the universe beyond Sokotrine's closed realm. There was nothing in this garden of knowledge I had left unread. But it wasn't like I had anything else to do. Picking out a book at random, I settled down on a comfy alcove on the second floor. Go ahead and read too, Tubby. I shut my eyes for a bit as I addressed Tubby. When I reopen them, an open book can be seen lying on the floor by my side. Now, what do we have here? None of the books in the Celestial Library had an author or title, but all it took was a quick glance at the first sentence for me to discover the book's contents. It's been a long time since I've read this one, or perhaps it hasn't been that long at all. A world of only one. It was a story about such a world. As if reflecting the heart of their sole reader, it was a theme that many of the books in this library shared. Now then, take me away once more. Let me slip and fall between the pages, the lines. If only for a moment, I shall dream. 
Once upon a time, there was a world that had lost all but one to time. A lone girl who did not know the warmth of others, yet longed for it still. One day, she beheld her reflection in the water and had a thought. If the person on the other side were to come over here, I would no longer be alone. It was a simple and childish wish. Yet the girl poured her everything into that wish. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years, decades, centuries, millennium. The girl created many selves as time tick-tocked away. One made of wood, one made of clay, one made of porcelain, and one made of plastic. She crafted those selves without end. Dolls that were her very splitting image that even moved as she might. Yet it was not enough for the girl. For while the dolls could move, it was only when she manipulated them to do so. A self that had their own thoughts and moved of their own will, the girl labored without end to bring such a self into the world. Until at last, she was finally able to fulfill her wish. A beautiful doll created in the girl's own image and dressed in trim of seven colors. Upon seeing its eyes open for the first time, the girl voiced the first greeting in her life. Hello, dear dreamer. However, the doll could only stare in silence, for it did not know of words. So the girl smiled deeply and widely from the bottom of her heart. For even if the doll did not know of words, it should know of smiles. That was what the girl thought, or rather, wished for. You must have so many questions. So let me show you, you are not a nil, my all fulfilled. Taking the doll's hand in hers, the girl turned to the water's surface, where two reflections rippled like the turning of a tail's pages, the jostling of an upended bookmark. Myself, monochrome, of seven colors, I am you, you are me. The puppet, the puppeteer no more, I am you, and you are me. Words spoken with a smile, they carried meaning to the doll could not grasp. Yet somehow, the doll felt it understood. This beautiful world I've always longed to share with someone. Won't you come and play with me? The world had not changed by the doll entering it. Yet to the girl, it felt that the world that she had known for time immemorial had been reborn. It was a life the girl had only been able to dream of. She showed the doll many things, teaching it and blessing it with old experiences made new. Laughing, playing, they collected precious treasures together. Memories, dreams, the two held them in their hands. Warm little stones plucked from the sky and placed in a bucket of water and sand. Then one day, as they gazed over the sprawling fields of a world that belonged all to them, the girl asked the doll a question. Is it fun? A simple, straightforward question, one the doll should have been able to answer. Yet, in the end, it could only cock its head. What is fun? I understand, but at the same time, I do not. <laughs> that answer is good enough for me. Is it? Yes, the reason you're not sure what fun is, is because it's all you know. Having never felt its absence, you are unable to fully grasp its presence. Huh? Winter's bite gives form to summer's light. The cold of night makes the sun bold and bright. Oh, I think I get it. The girl's words made the doll wonder about something. Will you show me unfun things as well? Of course, it's important to experience all the colors of life. Even sadness is a necessary sweet pain because it lets you know what happiness is. It's not enough to just be happy? Even if one knows the utmost of happiness, it is but a hollow construct in a vacuum if not complemented or contrasted by the other colors of life. Hollow. A coin with only one side is meaningless. Coins only have definition and value because they have two sides that can be judged relative to each other. You can't flip a coin and call heads or tails if there's only one side, can you? You can't. The girl giggled when the doll nodded in understanding. Though she was playful like this, she was very wise. There was never a moment when the doll was not learning something from her. Listen well, dear dreamer. 
A monochrome happiness has no value. Pleasant tints, painful shades, and tones that meld the two together, they're all treasures. It is for that reason that you are adorned in seven colors. Even things that are painful and sad should be wished for. That was what the girl said. But if so, if all the colors must be, is there something that must not be? If a canvas graced by all the colors of life is what is sought, is a blank canvas what is not? As if reading the doll's thoughts, the girl shook her head. A canvas that is blank can simply be painted over. No, what must not be allowed? Is a canvas that is never shared? Something changed about the girl at that moment. Yes, no matter how many canvases teeming with color you paint, if they are not shared, they are never truly complete. A voice that had always been full of brightness and warmth. It was now dyed a cold and distant shade. Did you know, dear dreamer? No matter how much I wish to, I can't create a story. Because a story is a world, and the minimum amount of people required to create a world is two. A writer can pen enough books to circle the horizon, but without a reader, a story can never be born of it. Without a reader, a book is nothing but a one-sided coin. No matter how much the author wishes for it, no matter how much they pour their soul into it, a story cannot be realized alone. Bitterness, frustration, sorrow, and despair. It was an expression the girl had never shown the doll before. The image of a stranger and somewhat familiar overlapped, making the doll afraid to reach to out. Afraid to reach out, I think. Yeah. But more than anything, I did not want to see the girl make such a face. So it spoke up, giving voice to its deepest desire. If it takes two people to create a world, then let me be that second person. Let me be your other half. The doll wanted to see the girl smile again, because without it, it was lost. Please, I don't know what I can do, but I want to help you. Won't you let me? But the doll's heartfelt plea, no, was met only with rejection. Words that carried the doll's earnest wish, they fell to the ground, unvoiced, unrealized. You can't. You can't create a world with me. Why? Why can't I? Because you do not possess a will of your own. What do you mean? Am I not here? Am I not speaking with you at this very moment? That too is just a lie. The words you speak are not your own. They are but the product of a script. The girl's eyes were alien, foreign. They were the eyes of a stranger the doll did not know. The doll did not understand. The girl who would gaze upon it with warm eyes and caress it with tender hands. Now only coldness dwelled within her eyes, a gulf that could not be traversed having opened up between the two. The doll could not bear it. It wanted the girl it held dear to come back. And so it asked of the girl, Why do you forsake me? I do not forsake you. You do. No, it is myself who I forsake. Because there is no one else, after all. There is no one else in the world but me. I am here. I exist. You are nothing but a doll. The doll could not accept the girl's words. And so, compelled by a denial that neared desperation, it lashed out at the girl. This. But something unexpected happened when the doll's hand made contact with the girl. This is... With a clacking sound, it had fallen to the ground. The girl's arm, an arm not of flesh and blood. There's nothing left for me to hide, is there? Sinking to her knees, the girl cradled the arm lying on the ground. Her hunched figure seemed incredibly small to the doll. Most of my body has already been replaced with doll parts. I am almost as much doll as you. The girl had spared nothing, not even her own body, in the yearning to create another self. It is for that reason that I know. The strings that attach the body and soul are the same as that which control dolls. Dolls like you don't have any will of their own. They are simply being inhabited by mine. 
strings that bestowed life and movement upon the girls' creations. Those very strings were the girls' chains. The dolls under my control cannot do anything beyond what I dictate. Even when they laugh, cry, and sing, those actions never stop being my own. Even you, dear dreamer, you cannot move unless I command it. You are incapable of disobeying the script I write for you. But most importantly, you are incapable of writing your own script. The doll did not know what to say. It did not know how to feel. Perhaps it was shock. Or perhaps it was because the girl had not yet determined what the doll might feel or say. You understand now, don't you, why you can't create a world with me? Because I am you, and you are me. A spell to break the glass seal. It left the doll's mouth unbidden. I am all alone in this world. This eternally repeating present. I deceived myself, deluded myself into thinking it was finally over. After so long, my time has finally begun to move. After so long, I'll finally be able to reach the future. That was what I thought. But it was just a hollow facade. As one, the doll and girl spoke of the cold truth that lay beneath gilded wonderland. Imagined warmth. Fabricated color. In the end, it's nothing but a lonely girl playing with dolls by herself. Something wet and clear began to stream down the girl's face. It was proof she was human, proof she was alive. And as a doll could not do the same, it was proof she was the only one in the world. A world like this, I don't need it anymore. I can't bear it anymore. A world of only one that continued to turn fruitlessly like a broken cog. I'm tired of it. So, so tired. I just want to rest now. So the last thing I will have you do, dear dreamer, is in this life of mine. At that moment, it extended from the doll's arms. A terribly cold denial, an affirmation wrought of steel. The key is already in the silver lock. All that is left to do is turn it. With mechanical steps, the doll marched forward, just as the girl directed, just as her will desired. <laughs> in the end, I knew exactly what I was doing, didn't I? The reason that I created you was to free me from this unending dream. As if guided by invisible strings, the doll's body moved forth. One step, two. The doll advanced towards the girl, tensing, rotating its arm. Now then, this dream that has gone on for far too long, it's time to wake up. With arms spread wide, the girl welcomed the doll into her chest, embracing it sweetly, tenderly, as the doll's seven colors turned to one. Red, the colorful canvas, red, the monochrome canvas. Vibrant, vacant, it became overwhelmed with a singular hue. So dark, so cold. Is this death? It's scary, isn't it, dear dreamer? The doll answered, it did not. A tear running down its porcelain cheek. Red as a rose, it was not clear, not clear like the raindrops that flowed down the girl's face. Alone, that's how I've been all my life but at the very least, I didn't want to die that way. With someone at my side, that's how I wanted it to end. Won't you grant that small wish of mine, dear dreamer? It was then that the doll's mouth moved, giving voice to one last gentle lie. I am here by your side. We shall sleep together, for I am you and you are me. And so the world of only one became that of none as the last that remained slipped into eternal repose. All right, guys, that's going to be it for this episode, so stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks for watching!